Good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, all uh, very much for showing up. Um, uh, I thought I would just uh, give um, uh, a, a brief kind of prehistory of the uh, 70. Uh, just tell a story that uh, kind of sets the stage for the amazing uh, developments uh, uh, in uh, building the first 70 that you're going to hear about from uh, the folks that uh, actually built it. Uh, and of course, uh, from many neuroscientists, both uh, uh, from here at the Martino Center and from around the world who have been using 7T, you know, to teach us some brand new things. But how is it that we actually came uh, to have a, a 7T scanner? Um, it's an interesting story. Uh, you know, uh, like uh, many uh, stories, uh, everybody has their own uh, uh, personal perspective on it. Um, but my own perspective, at least, uh, has the story starting uh, with a colleague of ours, uh, Steve Hyman, uh, who uh, many of you know for a while was the head of the National Institute of Mental Health uh, and was uh, and now is at the uh, Stanley Center of uh, the Broad Institute. Um, but uh, way back when, uh, Steve was a colleague of ours uh, at the uh, Mass General Hospital, uh, interested in studying uh, substance abuse, uh, mostly in animal models, and he noticed that there was a request for applications from the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, for proposals to use what was then the new technology of functional MRI to uh, study the brain uh, uh, in uh, the setting of addiction. Uh, and so uh, Steve approached me along with uh, two uh, 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 bright and very energetic uh, young colleagues of his, uh, Randy Golub and uh, uh, another that you'll hear from uh, later today, Hans Breiter. Uh, and uh, they brought forward the notion that, you know, we should write a grant together. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what we did for a living. So uh, uh, we set out to, to do exactly that, uh, wrote a big grant. And as a result of that grant, uh, Hans Breiter, uh, along with uh, kind of an army of people uh, 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 and a, a tremendous concerted effort, actually performed the first uh, Your Brain on Drugs uh, study with uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, you know, put on the cover of uh, Neuron, a very uh, uh, important paper showing the ability of the tool uh, to be able to acquire data of the uh, brain, uh, in this case, with a pharmacologic activation and not just the behavioral one. Um, so that, of course, was done at 1.5T, Hans, or 3T? That was at 4.5. Yeah, no. Definitely not. I never. Three T. There we go. <laughs> well, one of those. One of those other than seventy field strengths. Um, and, there we go. Yeah. Well, if you sum up the one five and the three T, that would be four point five. So uh, there we go. It's one of those. Uh, in any case, uh, this influential paper came out, uh, and then uh, uh, our, uh, our colleague uh, Steve Hyman, who had then left the MGH, gone down to uh, the NIH, um, you know, sent somebody up and. Uh, uh, you know, Hans mentioned to me that he had a visitor that day and, uh, you know, I should probably meet him. Uh, and he was a fellow by the name of uh, Al Brandenstein. Now, Al Brandenstein uh, ran something called CTAC, the Counter Drug Technology Assessment Center, which was part of the drug czar's office, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And if you look at some of the old pictures, you'll see it said the MGH Siemens ONDCP magnet. That's the Office of National Drug Control Policy. So how did that name get on our magnet? Well, it's because of Al. Al came by uh, and uh, was asking about the technology, spent a lot of time with uh, Hans, spent some time with others, uh, and uh, wandered his way into my office. And we just started chatting. It turned out he had a very interesting background. He uh, was kind of a CIA spook, uh, spent time in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, during the time of the Vietnam War, doing things that he wasn't really able to fully tell me about. Um, you know, colorful guy. We're having this kind of conversation. You know, kind of an interesting one, not extremely science oriented. But then at the end of the conversation, he said, "Well, how can I help you?" And I had known that he had supported uh, in the past through this Counter Drug Technology Assessment Center uh, uh, PET imaging because uh, in addition to using the money that they would get when they uh, you know, busted uh, drug lords and uh, you know, took the cash out of the uh, back of uh, you know, the boats and the you know, cars or whatever, they used that money, of course, to buy uh, you know, radars and high-speed boats for drug interdiction. In other words, to try to drop the uh, supply of drugs. He also was rather visionary and had the notion that he would also invest in 
reducing the demand for drugs, the demand side of the equation. And he invested uh, in colleagues like Nora Volkow, who was then at the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, in PET imaging as a way to study the brain. His uh, assumption is if we could understand the brain on drugs, we could help reduce the demand for it. And that would be maybe an even more productive way to fight the uh, war on drugs than just uh, you know, trying to stop drugs from coming over the border. So uh, in the context of that, he was uh, asking me, uh, you know, essentially, how could I help? And I kind of wasn't really expecting that and had to quickly kind of, you know, think of, you know, what it was that uh, we were going to ask for. So there were a couple big projects that uh, we had in mind. We were thinking at that time of putting in magnetoencephalography. That was a, another uh, kind of emerging technology, one we were very interested in. Um, and uh, uh, that had a price tag of maybe, you know, $4 million or so. Uh, and then uh, we had a, 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 another uh, colleague, uh, Tommy Vaughn, who was uh, uh, then a, a, a physicist and an MR engineer at the lab, who had been uh, talking for some time about building a 6T scanner. Uh, that was the field strength he thought was the right one. Uh, and uh, he was kind of promoting that, but we didn't really have any way to fund it at that point. It was beyond what we could get from NIH, but it was kind of an interesting notion circulating in the back of our heads. Uh, and I knew from my discussions with him that, you know, roughly speaking, an MR scanner, you know, scaled, you know, as about a million dollars a Tesla. So I knew that, you know, his 6T scanner was going to be about a six million dollar adventure. So I figured if somebody's asking me, you know, what is it that I want, I might as well pick the most expensive thing that I could think of. So the 7T, uh, excuse me, the 6T, you know, stuck in my brain. But when I went to Al, I said, you know, we want a 7T scanner. So, you know, why 70? Well, I figured we're not going to get all the money we want. And when they, you know, do the 10% cut, we'll have enough money to build a 60 scanner <laughs> and we're going to be good. So I said, build a 70 scanner. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, well, you know, how much is that going to be? And I said, oh, you know, it's about a million dollars a Tesla. And he looked up, we can do that. Now, let me tell you, in the world of academia, that's about as good a day as you're ever going to get. That, that, was, that was pretty much the pinnacle of my academic career right then and there. And literally, with uh, that and, you know, a short white paper that Hans and other colleagues had generated, uh, the Office of National Drug Policy, uh, you know, had committed to supporting a seven Tesla scanner uh, at the uh, Mass General. Uh, and, you know, from that moment, and a literally a check for $7 million from uh, uh, the ONTCP uh, started the efforts that you're going to hear about uh, today from the rest of the crew. Uh, so with that background, I think, uh, Larry, are you uh, first on deck? I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Larry to uh, uh, tell you uh, how that money got spent and uh, what we uh, brought from it. The money's gone, by the yeah. way. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks, and uh, I echo everyone's uh, points that it's really great to see a lot of old friends here and people we haven't seen in literally decades. So uh, just to kick things off, I'm gonna show a few slides. And the first thing everybody sort of at, has asked me about this event, the, the astute observer would note that, well, you know, your first images on the 7T, you know, weren't till like 2001, you know, that's not really quite 20 years, right? So what do I mean by 20 years? And to answer that, you have to ask like, well, when things like, when you ask when was Notre Dame built, you know, kind of a similar project. Um, <laughs> Wikipedia says the construction began in 1160. And then they say it was largely complete <laughs> by 1260. So if the, the birth of Notre Dame is a hundred year long process, it's not too surprising that the birth of 7T was like a few years. So I'm taking it more from that definite date of when construction was started. And actually it was really started a little bit more than 20 years ago, the planning and, and uh, the project kickoff. And uh, I think also like Notre Dame, you know, the date that people really remember these days is April 15th, 2019, when it caught on fire. And we sort of have our own equivalent of that. And that was July 2017, when the 7T quenched. And I, I couldn't get the exact date. I have an email that's probably like within a day, but I didn't know whether it quenched the day before, but I'm sure Thomas, it's burned into his memory. So we'll probably hear a little bit more about that year long, just like it's gonna take years to rebuild Notre Dame. It, it took quite a while to rebuild our 7T. 
So before there was this, you know, fancy new stuff like the Terra that just went into Bay 2 and has now uh, taken images. You know, there was a grant, which uh, Bruce alluded to. It was, uh, I recall, written right after the Sydney ISMRM meeting in about a week and a half. And uh, I would actually missed half of it because I was snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef. But uh, I did get back to the last bit of it. And uh, I dug up that grant. Uh, it's in my file cabinet. And I just want to point out the timeline. We said we were going to build the thing in 13 months to acceptance testing. So a little bit optimistic. It was maybe like three years. <laughs> Actually, three years is probably optimistic. And uh, there's also some other paperwork in there. There was a, uh, a quote dated uh, from 1998, which really kicked off the uh, purchase of the magnet. We purchased it while we were still uh, a GE site, and we were sort of undergoing this process of switching vendors, and the, the research agreement with Siemens was uh, not reached for basically another year later. So we were well underway of ordering the 7T when that was switched, so that's another milestone. And then, of course, you know, this was uh, South Central that had to be uh, dug out. It was like a giant swimming pool, and uh, there was a lot of construction to be done a lot of steel to be lined up. I think we'll be seeing some of these pictures. Visits to Magnex that I fondly recall taking with Doug uh, in the rain in the English countryside uh, to visit the Magnex site and to see it, the plan and to see it being built. And then of course, finally, it comes in 2001. So the Magnet shows up pretty much first of the year 2001. And uh, oh, it's ramped in 2001, sorry. It, it arrived actually in 2000. So. Um, again, you can try to figure out when the birth of it is. And the first image, this was the first image taken, and I couldn't get, I couldn't find the exact date. Maybe Andreas has it, uh, but it was uh, late 2000, I think. Yeah, and it was like a, a toy image. It was nothing serious. It was like a phantom, the size of a marble, and you know, a little tiny surface coil. And like we had one watt of RF power. Yeah, one watt. So it was, a, it was just a, an image to say we took an image. And uh, a lot of construction and hand-tuned workmanship went into this magnet early on, uh, thanks to Simon and many others. And uh, then we were finally uh, really what I would call imaging in 2001 and 2002. And these were really the first image. They weren't the first images, but I would say they were the first like eye-opening images. So we were doing monkeys. We had to get an IDE from the FDA because at that time uh, you needed it for 7T. So we were kind of stuck on monkeys for a little bit. And uh, these images really got people's attention because of the resolution and the fact that, of course, you can see very nice laminate structure, uh, the line of Genari layer four, but also layer one of myelinated sheets. And, and uh, I, I also remember this because I was really excited. You know, we're really seeing good images and something new at 7T. <laughs> I submitted an ISMR abstract. It's the only abstract I've had that's been rejected. <laughs> and yet, at the same meeting, those images were shown all over the place because I had shared them and they were in a plenary talk, they were in other talks, they just weren't in my talk because <laughs> that was rejected. Anyway, so I'll take it out on the ISMR in another way. <laughs> Get the last laugh. And lots of work on coils. Uh, you'll hear uh, some of this from, of course, Andreas and Graham and, and uh, Boris. Um, and uh, then, of course, the first subject here. We do have a record of that. I dug up the consent form. I'm hopefully not blowing his anonymity by saying it's Andreas, who <laughs> we'll be hearing from later. You can see he survived. And that was in August 2002. And the images weren't horrible, but they weren't that good either. So there was a lot of time uh, fixing coils and fixing artifacts. And uh, I also dug up some notes and one of my documents was a little thing I'd written up to myself in August 1998 when we were planning that, and it said, will the EPI look so distorted that it will be, that it'll severely limit what we can do with functional imaging. I was really worried about this because, you know, let's face it, EPI is hard and 7T susceptibility is bad and Quite frankly, at 3T, it was, you know, sort of touch and go. And, uh, you know, luckily with a lot of work with some of the people in this audience and, and others, you know, 
the 7T EPI can be beautiful with the right, uh, you know, technical um, chops behind it, either this is the case a head gradient and 32 channel coils. And this is of course work that uh, John Palomini pushed a lot. So uh, with that, I just conclude and we'll start with our first speaker that, uh, you know, we work like dogs in this project, <laughs> as, you, as you can see. <laughs>